Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Raghav and uh, I'm the president of this chapter at Santa Clara University. Uh, Aiden, uh, yeah. Aiden Nichols. And uh, Owen, uh, he's the treasurer and he's the secretary. We have a vice president who's in Spain right now studying abroad. And uh, it is my honor over here to welcome Lawrence Jones as a speaker. Uh, Lawrence Jones is a campus reform editor in chief. And prior to joining Campus Reform, he hosted his own show on the Blaze Radio Network, served as a contributing host for the Blaze TV, and he appears regularly on Fox News, Fox Business, CNN, MSNBC. Uh, in 2013, his work as an investigative journalist played an uh, important role in exposing corruption in the Affordable Care Act marketplace. His work was instrumental in bringing reform to the funding of the Act, and uh, he earned the Freedom Works 2013 Activist Award of the Year. Uh, he has also been listed on Red Alerts 30 and 30 and New Max's 30 Most Influential Republicans. He attended the University of North Texas and is a native of Garland, Texas. Uh, he served on the boards of Garland Parks and Recreation and Dallas County Ch Child Welfare. Now, please give a warm welcome to Lawrence. <coughs> Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, typically, you know, I give this this spiel and then I open it up for a Q&A. I want to tell you a little bit about what you're fighting for, uh, your why, um, and then I want to get some questions on how we can advance. One of my specialties is helping young conservatives um, get into the media space, and it's also helping conservative libertarians understand minority outreach. Um, so I'll give you a quick rundown of where. I started. Um, and when I was 15 years old, I was a freshman in high school. I was recruited by the Obama campaign to run part of their campaign in Dallas County. So I started off as a Democrat. Um, part of the reason why I was is because there was no conservatives on campus. Um, there was no one sharing the message. And quite frankly, where I come from, if you saw a Republican, you just automatically considered them to be racist. So they really didn't have a shot with me. Um, as I you know, got involved with the Obama camp and after he got elected, I had certain principles that I wanted him to implement. And that was saving my community. My mom had me at 16, I'm the oldest of three. Um, we lived in poverty. And so there was obvious issues that I wanted to be, uh, issues that I wanted to be addressed. Reforming the education system, uh, criminal justice reform, economic prosperity. And all of those were campaign promises that were made that I didn't quite frankly feel that were delivered. As a result of that, uh, I went out on this self-discovery period trying to figure out actually what I do believe. Um, because every time I would bring these issues up to the Democratic Party, they kept telling me, wait, wait, we'll get to it, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. And after being told that for so long, you finally get frustrated and you start to explore other parties, other um, ideologies to see if there was some alignment with it. Um, and so I started looking into conservatism. And, um, you know, I know that I've been on these boards as a Republican, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a Democrat, I'm a Libertarian. Um, I, after my discovery and going back and forth through political parties, I realized that there's really no political party that fits my interests. Um, because there's always uh, loyalty to your tribalistic causes and not the people that you're supposed to be serving. Anyway, long story short, I ended up going undercover in the Democratic Party for an entire year. Um, and that's how I exposed uh, voting fraud, um, health care fraud, um, selling social security numbers. Um, and that was my sophomore year in college. Um, after that, it got national media exposure, and I ended up doing the O'Reilly Factor one night. And I've been on national TV ever since. Um, I took a job at The Blaze TV uh, my sophomore year. Um, after all that media blitz. And um, I really went there to grow. Um, investigative journalism, storytelling. Uh, and then after that, I wanted to prepare people that were my age for this new age of media. Um, you know, I, 
I'm sure you guys see it today. There are so many people now that have become these social media stars. Um, they, they have gotten the tweets down, they have gotten the YouTube channels down, they have gotten the Instagram um, down, but they quite frankly don't know what they believe. And so you see these people going um, in these rabbit holes because they can only recite the talking points that someone else has distributed to them. But when it comes to defending the cause, they flip-flop on the issues. Um, and so I really wanted the next generation that I was going to be working with at Campus Reform to be solid reporters or if they decided to be opinion contributors and wanted to have a career, whether it was Fox News, CNN, that they would be equipped to do that. Uh, and so that's why I joined uh, Campus Reform. Uh, real quickly, um, how many of you guys in here understand what your why is in the movement? Who, who knows their why? Who knows their why? You know your why? Yes, what's your why? Yeah, push your what? Yeah. 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 I would say I would mostly fighting for just clarity. You know, a lot of people, especially today, not a lot of mixed messages getting sent out. Yeah. We're not getting actual, I would just say, information correct. Mm -hmm. and, you know, especially social media is playing a huge, huge, huge impact, and a lot of people are very misinformed. So right now you're in the learning phase of, of, yeah. of you're getting information. In general, yeah. Okay. You know, so, so when I say your why is. Before you decide whatever career that you're going to get into or if you're going to go into media, you have to first be able to identify what you're fighting for, right? Because um, there's going to be party affiliations, there are going to be media organizations that try to pull you to a certain um, cause, a certain mission, and if you don't know what you're fighting for, you're going to be drifted into all different directions. Um, you've got to have a compass as to what you live by. So for example, my why is serving the black community. That's not saying I don't care about any other community, but it is saying that I got into politics because I saw a need in my community. As I said, the education system needs to be reformed, criminal justice reform. So every time I'm on TV fighting for issues, I find a way to link it back to my community because that is my purpose. That's what I'm here to do. This, that is the community that I'm out there to serve. Um, and so, for example, um, let me give you a quick example. When it comes to criminal justice reform, you've seen a lot of rhetoric from both sides on this issue. Recently, you saw the president say that we should be critical of the FBI uh, because they've gotten too big. They start spying on Americans. Now, that was new for the Republican Party because we've traditionally had an ideology of just back the blue at any cost. The FBI is a part of the blue. Um, whereas members of the left have always said, let's be critical of the FBI, let's do that. And now, all of a sudden, Let's trust the FBI. Um, and now the Republicans have switched to saying, let's be critical of the FBI. And so if you can see, it's a political football where there really isn't a value system of which we should all be holding is liberty, um, trust but verify, to question all members of government, whether it's the police department or it's the IRS buying uh, and, and taking tax dollars from American, or if it's the CIA, um, um, targeting Americans. Um, and so because those political parties didn't have a set interest in serving the people, when it became a, 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 a pissing match between the president and the FBI, they decided to just go back and forth, right? Um, so it's important to understand that why, so you know who and what you're fighting for. Um, let me give you an example of some outreach um, strategies going forward because you know, we, we've seen the Kavanaugh hearing, we've seen, um, you know, uh, some of the things that have happened in college campuses when it comes to innocent until proven guilty. Um, now you're guilty and until proven innocent. Um, and so that's why I'm so focused on the college campuses because the culture is coming from here and moving on to the mainstream. Everyone started freaking out when they saw what happened to Kavanaugh uh, on the Supreme Court. And little did they know that the process that was followed was the same thing that happens every day on college campuses. 
Now, it may not be this college campuses, but the majority of the college campuses that we report on at Campus Reform shows that, quite frankly, a man, if he's accused of any sex crimes or anything on the college campuses, he has to prove his innocence. There's no uh, legal process. Many times it goes through bureaucrats that are on the college campuses that have no legal degrees. Um, they're not elected judges. Um, it's not a real criminal process where um, actual detectives have to do an investigation. They have to prove they're innocent. And the people wonder why, when he got to Kavanaugh, that people were just able to just say these uncorroborated uh, accusations. Um, and then when you dig into them, there was multiple inconsistencies. But our culture from the college campuses have essentially taught the mainstream on how to handle these things. Right? So it's never, the, the fight that we're in right now is not a liberal versus Republican fight. It's about American values. Do you believe in basic things? Do you believe that you have the right to face your accuser? Do you believe that you're innocent and you're proven guilty? Right? That's what we're fighting right now. And so often I go to these college campuses, and whether you're fighting for your conservative cause or your basic American causes, I see a lot of conservative students and liberties uh, minded students timid in that fight. And that's because they don't want either the pushback, they don't want to be called racism on college campuses, they have seen their signs, whether you're a pro-life uh, student on college campuses, or uh, you're a minority on the college campus, and you're just trying to let your voice be heard. And so you don't get in the fight because, you know what, I, I, I just don't want, I just want to get my education and go home, right? But quite frankly, you don't have that choice anymore. Because the tone that's been setting on, on the college campuses is affecting the mainstream. People laugh at Ocasio-Cortez. She won. <laughs> like, she defeated a 20-year veteran uh, uh, of the Democratic Party, a guy that was next in line for leadership after Nancy Pelosi. So all these jokes about her are irrelevant. She won. Socialism is winning right now. You can laugh at Bernie all day, but he when he recruited some minions. And they're inspiring some people. They got four of them elected this last election cycle. So although socialism does suck, you gotta be able to combat what sucks. Ben Shapiro has this line, I've even used it in the past, that facts don't care about your feelings, right? That's his favorite line, right? Everybody claps right when he says that. But what if I told you that folks do care about your feelings? See, people on the right are so convinced that we have won the argument that we don't even realize that if, you can win the argument all day, but if you don't get hearts and minds, then you lose. You can sit on your intellectual high horse all day, but if you can't convince your neighbor, have you done anything? Oh yeah, we took it to the libs. <laughs> well, the libs just won. Oh, Casey, you're so dumb. She's the youngest ever to be in Congress. Who really won? Sucks, right? But we've trained ourselves in our talking points. My favorite one is this. Back in the day before we decided on the right to accept Kanye, they used to tell me, I used to tell people all the time that if you want to reach more black people, then you need to do things of the culture, things that they can relate to, not the things that you relate to. And hip hop is one. Music has always been something that connects with my community. And when I told them that hip hop had a capitalism message in it, they told me, Lawrence, I, I don't know about that because it's actually part of the destruction of the black family. I mean, it's just too much thuggetry in there. To which my response was, so what about your kids? Because the number one consumer of hip hop is little white kids. Has it destroyed their families? But because on the right we were uncomfortable with something that we quite couldn't identify, we shunned it. But that's not how you win new people on your side. You have to get out of your, your uh, echo chambers. You have to be willing to debate your ideas. And Quite frankly, you have to be willing to meet people where they are. My conservatism is not going to look like the next man's conservatism. 
if I can find an individual out there and they're a capitalist, they don't agree with me on pro-life issues, but they're just a capitalist, I consider that a win. At least you don't believe in stealing money from me. I'll take it. If I can get you to question big government, I'll take it. I think part of the problem with the right is that we, when we invite people in, we say they have to hit this check box. Donald Trump didn't hit all the check boxes, but he won an election. The conservative intellectuals will tell you, he is not a true conservative. Well, you guys lost. You lost. You don't get to tell people what their freedom looks like. Donald Trump didn't go on stage and say, hey, these are all my policy choices. He talked to the needs of the American people. Even though I disagree with some of his policy stances, I'm smart enough to understand, well, you know what? He inspired someone out there. You think Barack Obama got on stage and presented the Democrats with all these policy choices? No, he didn't. He had a message, very simple. Hope and change. Donald Trump's? Make America great again. It was that simple. Meanwhile, 16 Republicans on the stage all had their policy ideas, and he disarmed them all by saying, hey, actually, you guys are criticizing me about being a true conservative, but you, 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 you were all in my office asking for money. Oh, am I that bad? And the American people were like, huh. We've gotten all these politicians that are bought by the big businessmen Maybe we'll send the big businessmen into office. Again, I don't agree with a lot that Trump does. But his ability to connect with voters is important. And if you do stand for these true libertarian conservative values, then you better learn the art of connecting with people. And if you don't understand what your why is, what you're fighting for, you don't understand what your purpose, what your mission is, then you can't get new people. You have to have a solid foundation first. I get people all the time tell me that they want to go on TV. And when I ask them what their why is, they can't describe it. You're not ready. You're not ready for TV. You're not ready to even share your mission to other people in your neighborhood. Because you don't know what you believe. You can't just look at an ideology marker and say, hey, I'm a conservative, and then go out and share the gospel of conservatism. You can't just watch Fox News and hear what another commentator says and say, um, I'm ready to go get new people. You have to be a student of this. You have to be willing to say, okay, challenge your own points of view. And then, this may sound a little weird, talk like a human when you're trying to get people on your side. Talk about issues that affect them. You meet people where they are. This is a, it's a message of Christ, very simple. Kitchen table topics. Questions. Who's first? Questions, questions, don't be scared. So I got a question about the, uh, I guess, the current state of politics in the United States, and just more your opinion on how you feel like the rise of identity politics kind of play into like, the things that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, identity politics is, I feel like, what's destroying this country. Um, you know, I was, he was telling me a story of when they were tabling today, and they saw my photo on there, and they just immediately thought that they knew what I, I stood for. I'm like, oh. He's a black man. Can he really like be associated with you guys? Yeah. If it represents my value system, it's no longer right or left. It's about identity politics. It's all emotional arguments. We have the logical argument. Now connect it with people in their identity. Because that's part of the reason why the left is when they have mastered the game of identity politics. Let me give you an example. When I go and speak sometimes, uh, especially uh, when I'm speaking on the Second Amendment, one of the biggest things that I get uh, responses from liberals that decide to come in the audience, which I love because it challenges me, it provides dialogue. The first thing they always say to me is, Lawrence, 
How can you be so pro Second Amendment when the Second Amendment wasn't created for you? Now, most conservatives would say, let's fight them on that point, right? About it being made for them. But being intellectually honest is conceding with them and saying, look, I understand that the Second Amendment wasn't created for them. I understand that the period of time when they wrote that law. But guess what? It's mine now. And since it's mine now, and we came from that place, I don't intend on giving it back. That is the emotional argument that you go in response to a silly question like that. Don't fight them on the merits of history. That was true. But where are we right now? And if America was this horrible place that enslaved black folks, why in the hell would I put myself in a position where I can't defend myself? That is the argument that you make. Don't fight them back and forth on the identity politics because that person was already ready to just, okay, I got him right there. He's a black man, I need him, let's, let's go right after his identity. That, that's their first instinct. But you can use what they use, attempted to use against you, back at them. Okay, I am a black man, you got me. But this is an armed black man. I'll concede with you on where we were as a nation. I don't want to turn back to that place. So why would I give the government, that same government that enslaved me, more power? You explain that to me. Instead, you know what Republicans do? Well, the Republicans are the ones that freed the slaves. The Democratic Party is the founder of the KKK. OK, guys, what have you done lately? Are you in communities now? It's easy to preach what you've done in history. Can you give me some lately what you've done? Black unemployment is the lowest it's ever been. Okay, it is, but it's still double the national average. You've got to do a little bit more than that. You have to be able to know the issues, know what you stand for, and quite frankly, it's okay to disagree with your party or your ideology sometimes. They're humans. They screw up. My favorite part is when I go on CNN sometimes, how they try to trap me is defend Donald Trump. What are you doing in Charlottesville? My favorite response to that is Donald Trump is a grown man, okay? I'm not going to justify anything that Donald Trump does. I'm here as Lawrence Jones. This is what I stand for. This is what I stand for. This is what my mission is. If they can get you in this circle of defending a man, presidents come and go, people. Don't. Don't hit yourself to this, okay? Look how the Democratic Party is struggling right now, finding their new leader, because they were so entangled with Barack Obama, because he was charming, inspirational, articulate, whether you like him or not, he still got that it factor. I mean, the other day he was giving a speech, and I'm like, I don't even agree with what he's saying, but he's good. Homie is good. He can move a crowd. But he's done. He's done. He can't run for office anymore. And the Democratic Party has no one to fill that vacuum because they invested into his identity. And if I was the right, I wouldn't be so quick to laugh at them because they're doing the same thing with Donald Trump. Who will be the next leader? Well, it should be Mike Pence because he's right after Mike. He doesn't have the Donald Trump it factor. I'm not so sure he would win. Look at Ted Cruz, one of the most conservative members, but he's not likable. So boring, wants to preach to you. He's my senator in Texas. Just not likable. Beto almost destroyed him in Texas. How do you lose in Texas, dude? I mean, we're in 2%, but if you can't sell your conservatism in Texas, that's a messaging problem, homie. Any more? I want to address, you said earlier you would describe yourself as a libertarian. Yep. Right. I'm curious what you think of Trump's current uh, tariffs on steel. And I also am curious no who you, I'm also curious who you think in the Senate or in Congress right now, as a Republican or as a Democrat, um, represents the libertarian ideology. Good question. 
question. Uh, my probably my favorite senator right now. First of all, no, I'm tariffs. I don't support tariffs. I don't understand how you can say you're a free market conservative libertarian and support tariffs. Tariffs, taxes, taxes, tariffs. Big government, more money out of my pocket. Pass down to the consumer. It's just it's very simple for me. Um, Mike Lee is my favorite senator. It used to be Rand, but Rand gets a little squishy. He's nothing like his father. Um, he, he's very attached to Trump now, and so you know he's more, and he's just not likable either. Have you ever met the guy? Just not likable. Um, I feel bad for him though, for his neighbor beating the hell out of him and fracturing his ribs. Like that sucks. But he used to be one of my favorite senators at one point in time. But I think Mike Lee is the most reasonable senator, consistent. And then my favorite congressman is Justin Amash. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you brought up the Second Amendment and given your background, I know that um, the Second Amendment became um, a lot of um, just gun violence and there's been 307 mass shootings in the last like 312 days. So obviously that's a lot. Um, but given um, that you are a black male and that a lot of the people that have been killed in these mass shootings are minorities, how do you feel about what is your position and what do you think is it should be the best move next for America and gun policies? Um, look, I, I, I'm not in the, the business of legislating tools, right? I, I want to get to the symptom of the issue. And removing tools only makes the criminal shift to a different tool. And so, for me, um, I want to make sure I'm always in a position to defend my family, and I want other members of my community to be in a position to defend their families as well. Quite frankly, if I'm honest with you, when it comes to the gun issue on both political sides, even though we all have our moral and our political position, no one really knows the solution to stop this. Like, we can say it's mental health issues, we can say, oh, more gun control, but there have been states where they have the strictest gun laws and it still happens there. Um, there are people that have legally possessed a firearm that have committed these at point in time. The reality of it is, and I know a lot of people don't want to hear it, there's bad people. And the best thing that we can do as a society is stop ignoring bad people's signs that they put out there. I am so sick and tired of seeing People commit these mass shootings, and then we later find out that they had a record, that they either shot up their mother's house, that uh, they had mental health issues that was reported and no one did nothing, that it was reported to these schools. People just don't wake up one day and decide to blow people up, all right, and, and shoot people. They have, it's a pattern of behavior. And us as Americans, as law enforcement officials, as administrators, have to pay attention to the science and quite frankly, I think the people that ignore the sun should be held accountable. Um, there's not one shooting that I've seen lately where there was not a sign. And I think that's a failure of society. That's just my point. What five books would you recommend that become more learned in this one? Any more personal passions? So from an economic standpoint, my favorite is basic, basic economics. From Thomas Sowell, uh, it really kind of positioned my free market approach of things. Um, up from slavery was one of my favorites as well when it comes to Booker T. Washington, and uh, it kind of like started to form my point of view as far as as a black man within the movement. Um, Five. Six. Just the ones you Yeah, um. That's a good one. I would say that one kind of like. I'll give you the books that kind of like steered me. Those two. And then there's another one called How Should a Christian Vote by Dr. Tony Evans. It's a real quick, quick read. I'm a Christian, I'm a preacher's kid, and so it kind of convicted me in a way of making sure that my religion and my politics is lined up. I'm not saying that government should legislate religion, but it kind of got my political compass in order. Um, 
I can send you some more. Yeah. It's just, I just pick them up and read them and then just like sit them down. Um, but yeah, those are like the three that kind of like position my, my point of view. Have you ever I have not. A lot of people have referred it to me. Hi. Hello. My name's Ellie. I'm from Texas too. That's yes, right. don't mess. Yeah. Um, so I actually came to this talk because of the title called Liberal Privilege, as privilege is a subject a lot of my classes is dealing about um, right now. And I'd like to hear a little bit about that because I have a question about it. Yeah, so, uh, uh, um, so this is the Liberal Privilege Tour me and my colleague Kathy, Kathy Phillips are doing. And essentially, um, what I wanted to tackle is uh, a lot of the words like, for example, identity politics that liberals are able to use to uh, mask their methods of control. So whether it may be socialism or anything, it all goes back to their control. And they're never held accountable for their positions because they're liberals. And they're supposed to think progressively. And, it, and, and they feel like if they use these words that are supposed to benefit people, um, that they can mask their control in it. So that's the general consensus of the tour. Um, every day, I'm speaking somewhere, and it's a different topic at the point, point of time. Um, I was quite interested when you said identity politics mm -hmm. is destroying this country, and the that kind of counters the title of the tour, which is liber liberal privilege, and privilege is all about identity, right? Right. And I guess things I'm curious about is how this term can be used in relation to politics when uh, to this point it's been dealt with things like ethnicity, sexuality, ableness, age, and all of these have been structurally implemented. Um, I just want to know how this term can be legitimate if it's attached to changing waves of politics and if it's a word that's been used through history in different ways. You mean identity? Yeah. So, what I like to tell conservatives is that you cannot run away from your identity. It is a part of our foundation, it's a part of who we are, we all have different identities. The problem with identity politics is when you just define somebody just by their identity. And I think that's a lot what the left is. I'm never gonna run away from me being a black man, right? That's who I am, it's part of who I am. It's not, I shouldn't just be defined as a black person. But when people insult my intelligence and say that I should feel um, in support of these movements that are trying to end white privilege, I often tell people that I've never been discriminated against in a workplace. Like people may have tried to attempt it, but it's never stopped me from getting a job because I can do it myself, right? My, my job is to outdo my opponent, no matter the obstacles that I may face. Have I experienced racism? Yes. But my identity is never going to stop me from being who I am. And a lot of the leftists, what they do is, they tell students and young people that your identity will prevent you because of the structures that were put in place. And I think that's total BS. Um, either you're a competitor or you're not. Um, I'm the youngest person in, uh, that's on cable news right now. I'm also a black man. I got hired in television before I could drink, right? And no one even checked to see if I had a college degree or anything. They didn't find out my age until I signed my contract. But isn't media the hardest place for black people to get involved? When you look at the statistics, it is. It didn't stop me, though, because I never used my identity as a void for me, as, as a hindrance. What I disagree with what liberals do is that they constantly use your, the identity of people as if it's a burden. I'm proud to be a black man. It's not a burden on me. If you could choose one other label for this tour that doesn't get entangled with identity that has been progressing and has had actual changes on people's lives, what would you choose? What do you mean a label? Choose another label. I feel like this label is being associated with 
a like concrete issue that someone will have to deal with over their whole life when politics actually changes and that's what makes conversation happen whereas poli like, you like your identity that is not political that you're like born with and have to deal with has different implications but didn't the people make it political didn't liberals make it political Conservatives never made the argument that identities don't exist. But when you start using it for political purposes, that's where it became the problem. That's why this, this, the speaking tour is called liberal privilege. Because for a long time, liberals hadn't been held accountable for using people's emotions and their identity, identity against them. I can definitely see that. And I would say that associating the word liberal privilege with censorship of conservative ideals on campus says that liberals have a structurally like more privileged place in society within the college campus they do. but that is not functionally what is happening in government and in conversation, the conversation so I feel like that's a misleading term it's not let like I agree with your argument tell you, on let me tell you why because the tour is a, it's a college campus tour. And so when you have liberals that dominate the college campuses, when you have, when you go on my site, campusreform.org, and see the conservatives that are harassed every single day just because of their point of view, and you don't believe it, you can look at the academic research that we pulled all the FBC reports for all the college administrators uh, and professors and staff members, and 98% of them give to Democratic candidates. And so the positions on the college campuses, whether it's the clubs, like this was one of the first clubs that I was at where a turning point chapter was able to meet with a faculty advisor to get their club here. At many campuses that I go and speak of, I have to have security on college campuses that their, their, uh, their clubs are taken away. The liberal clubs aren't taken away. They don't have to pay extra fees to be there. That is a privilege. Um, and they say that they are for more speech, but when it's something that they disagree with, they try to censor them. I, I've had my students assaulted, assaulted by campus administrators, literally, literally. Their cell phones, when they record them for, for having bias on the college campus, they try to strip their cell phones and, 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 and smash them. We have to set up a cloud system for our students when they're doing their reporting, so when they when they do damage their phone, it sends it to our headquarters. That's what I mean when I say liberal privilege, because the liberals, by far, whether you're, and, and it's not just a conservative point of view, if you will talk to liberals, they will tell you they dominate the college campuses. That's a privilege. So you said that um, you don't think that the government should um, legislate religion and I think it's like value <coughs> privacy in regards to the government yep. in our lives. Yep. Um, and then on top of that, um, as a libertarian, how can you support the regulation of women's bodies and the regulation of abortion? The government has a duty to protect life before everything. Before you get liberty, you gotta have life. If you have no life, then how do you have liberty? I think it's the government's role to protect life first before anything. They have a duty to protect all life. It's not about the woman's body, it's about the child inside of that body. Okay, So I have this simple philosophy when it comes to all government, and it includes the blue as well. I grew up wanting to be a cop. I don't know what the blue is. Uh, the blue typically represents police officers and law enforcement. Um, it's called the thin blue line. So um, Republicans always say back the blue, and I always tell them that you back the law first, and the blue in most situations back the law. But when they don't, just like all government agencies, we should hold them accountable. Does that make sense? So whether it's the IRS 
or your local police department, they have to, they cannot take away liberties without due process. Uh, they cannot violate citizens' rights. And so although I'm supportive of enforcers of the law, I have to make sure that they're supporting the law before I can support them in every situation. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, and how would you say that the FBI is not Well, the leadership of the FBI was caught spying on Americans. That's a problem. Okay? When there's a corruption, when people, when political candidates are literally saying they're going to use opposition research against another political candidate, that's a problem. The FBI, that's not their job. They can have their personal political views, but they cannot use their position of power and authority um, as a result to, to advance their political cause or to target political opponents. The FBI has a long history of doing it, whether it was Dr. King uh, in the Civil Rights Movement um, and spying on Mirka Orids um, today, uh, political opponents, opponents that they don't like. That's the history of the FBI. You can go look at J. Edgar Hoover and look at it. It's been a, uh, a constant thing. And it's a government agency. All, all government agencies we should watch. It doesn't, just because they have a badge under their chest, should not make us want to watch them. They're enforcers of the laws that Congress enacts, and Congress should enact laws that advance the liberty uh, and protect the liberties of the American citizens. And so I'm going to be watchful of all government agencies, enforcers of the law, lawmakers, all of them, none of them. Spying on Americans, that means whether they, if they're um, tapping your phone calls or they have these, you see the street cameras right now that are tracking people's license plates, their movement and all that, all that. I have no problem with private companies doing that. Mm -hmm. Like if Facebook, if you decide that you're going to uh, click the terms of use for Facebook, sorry, you signed your life over. You should read the terms of condition. But if the government is doing that, that's where it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? No, I think so it takes all of that media and everything on the, there are social media with like those red flags. So we think it'll take more government supervision. No, I don't think it takes more government supervision. I think us as Americans should be conscious of our surroundings. And when we see something <laughs> and we report, uh, see, in, in many of these cases, these shooters have already violated laws that protections are already put in place. They, they, they have violated mental health. Uh, by, uh, 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 exams, they have violated certain statutes that would prevent them from getting a, a firearm. And when citizens report it and the local police department doesn't act on that, that's a problem. So I think us as citizens should be more aware and hold the people in charge accountable to do something. Um, and in many cases, they don't. Um, there were several, even with the FBI uh, in, in, uh, in Florida, the last shooting, there were reports made to the FBI in the call center, and they didn't do anything. They didn't follow up. The guy was arrested eight times. Domestic violence in, in the household. I mean, come on. The, the recent shooting in uh, California in the bar, the guy shot in his mom's house. I don't, I don't know what else they need to know to know that this guy shouldn't have had a firearm, but that was enough for me. So um, I think we should start off um, actually enforcing the laws that we have in place before we start talking about new laws. Does that make sense? All right, thank you for speaking. Uh, so my question uh, is kind of recounting what you said about uh, Ocasio-Cortez and some similar candidates to her um, and their ability to win hearts and minds. Uh, for me, I feel like a lot of their ability to do that comes from um, elements in their campaign finance strategies and that they tend to try to run like grassroots or corporate free campaigns. As someone who's you know pretty well versed in the conservative movement, do you think that corporate free campaigns have a place in the, on the right wing? Um, look, I came from grassroots, and I think the right is, is far away when it comes to the liberals and their technology. Um, there, there is no, 
there's no amount of money that can um, uh, outweigh person, uh, people getting on the ground and knocking on doors and talking to Republicans, right? And that's what Beto just did. That's what Cortez did. Um, and I think the right has been so, and a lot of Democrats as well, you know, it's not really a partisan issue, is that so many people are depending on the money to run ads, to send mailers, when it's really just voter interaction. Um, and so, I, yeah, it can be corporate free, but it's money free. Just, just do the right thing. Go talk with voters, figure out what issues that matter to them, and you'll win. That's how Cortez won. She had a lot of money. Homegirl can't even pay her own apartment in DC, right? <laughs> so it's not like she had a big money strategy. But again, we laugh, but it's a true testament to what she was able to do. She can't even get on a party, but she was able to win an election because she went and talked with people. Super quick follow-up questions to your comment um, about abortion. So I just wanted to know, first of all, when do you consider life to begin, and where is your evidence for that? Um, just and then specifically, I guess your views on like the Plan B pill, for example, um, because a lot of people think that the Plan B pill is like an abortion pill, um, when in fact it just prevents um, the conjoined egg and the sperm from implanting so, the placenta. Yeah. So that's my first question. Yeah. And then my second question is. Um, Specifically on your comment about the government kind of protecting life, and that's its like first and foremost concern. Um, if I think that's a lot something that a lot of conservatives say, right? That like the life of the fetus is more important, and that it needs to be protected. I think that's something that the Constitution says too. Yeah, that's fine. So I guess my follow-up <laughs> question. Is, um, yeah, um, but my follow-up question. So is I think that oftentimes conservatives like to say that they care about that life so much, but I guess my question is why do conservatives seem to oftentimes back away um, from protecting that life after the child is born, um, specifically in like communities that are low income or persons of color, um, because most conservatives don't believe in like welfare programs and things like that, so what happens to that life when it is born into a family that can't afford to take care of it or, you know, yeah, basically things like that. I mean, sure. My question is just like, what is your view on that? So, I'll, I'll start with the first one. Yeah. Um, I, I don't personally believe in Plan B pills, but I'm not opposed for people from using it. Okay. That's my personal uh, view, though. Okay. Um, I, I'm against abortion facilities, especially since they target people of my uh, community. The majority of these uh, clinics are in black neighborhoods, and Margaret Sanders started her position to eliminate the black race. And so, that is my position. So. Um, I'm not a, a fan of any organization that targets black lives. Um, that's the best for, for starters. Uh, when it comes to social brand programs and helping uh, minorities of color that end up after life, so I always I have this thing saying that I say, life from the womb to the tomb. Um, I was that, that kid. My mom had me at 16. So I, I've been poor the majority of my life. I'm just now making it out. Um, and so, Look, although I'm not for a wasteful program, I do think that... Wait, did you say wasteful? Wasteful program. I'm not for wasteful programs. I think it's unrealistic of us to think that somehow we're going to be able to just take the rug out of it. Now, I do believe that government should not be doing all of these welfare programs that the private sector should be able to do because I believe that they're able to track it more and give people the quality, uh, of whether it's... Get them the systems that they need, your local churches, um, uh, nonprofits in the area. I believe that it should be their role. But I'm also realistic to know that it's never going to get passed under Congress. And so my only mission right now is to get those programs where it's reasonable and, and it's not waste, fraud, and abuse in those programs right now. And so I partner with organizations like FGA, the Foundation for Government Accountability, where they not only um, advocate to get people off those social programs, but they also advocate to give them assistance and, and, and finding jobs as well. And getting them highway job, jobs. And then they partner with uh, local businesses where they can get uh, technical education because everyone doesn't need to go to a four-year university. 
Um, I don't know if you've looked at your plumbing bill or your electrician bill, but they make pretty good money. Yeah. Um, and so I want to make sure that I also have an uh, alternative for those people. So <coughs> I'm anti-big government program, but I'm also pro-private sector, finding these people with places to work so they don't have to depend on the government. Because a lot of people, uh, once they get in the system, they tend to remain in the system. And I don't like that. Just don't you think it's a little inconsistent, though, to say that the government has that duty to protect life, but then once the life is born, it should be privatized? So I, I, I guess I don't understand your question. To protect life as your physical life? Yeah, they, they should protect your physical life just whether it's national defense, they have a they, they have a a, 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 a a duty constitutionally to protect people, whether it's the local police departments patrolling, patrol, patrolling the border, um, your physical life. Now there also is a right of the mother to let her raise her own children as well. You see what I'm saying? And so local communities should be involved with making sure uh, that these kids have the tools. I was a community child where the local businesses saw something in me and they invested in me. Um, and I was just a community baby. We didn't have to depend on government uh, resources or anything like that because the community pitched in. Like, we're a giving country. The notion that somehow that um, Americans are just going to leave people out to drive this nonsense. We're the most giving nation. Um, quite frankly, if you look at the We're data, one of the few countries that doesn't have universal health care, so I don't know how giving we are. But. What do you mean? You mean private giving or government giving? I don't necessarily uh, mean giving more tax dollars for ineffective programs that the government uh, does. I mean, maybe one government program that is actually benefiting people in a positive way. Because many of these programs, although they, I'm not saying they don't have good intentions, I think all of these programs start off with uh, good intentions to protect America. I think affirmative action started out with a good purpose. But when you're at Harvard University and discriminating against Asian students, which is another minority group, I think that's a problem. And so many of these programs, they want to really help people. But I'm sorry, government bureaucracy and fraud, waste, and abuse often comes. That doesn't happen in the private sector a lot because you're accountable to the dollars. You're accountable to your donors. And that's all I want for uh, people that are struggling. I want actual nonprofit organizations that have a duty to protect the funds that their donors are giving to them. Uh, and and it's going to want the best for those people, not people that are going to waste their food stamp cards or, 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 uh, or their health care programs and throw the medicine away and all that good stuff. Okay. Um, I mean, I guess I agree that these nonprofit organizations are awesome. I just still feel like for the government to step in and tell a woman that she has to have a child and then tell her that she needs to get help within the community just kind of seems inconsistent. Just by uh, curiosity, how do, you feel, how do you feel about Margaret Sanger targeting black babies? The what? Margaret? How do you feel about Margaret Sanger targeting black babies? I mean, I feel like that's kind of a conspiracy theory. That's not a conspiracy. You can read her. We can read her. You can go back and read her journals, what she set out to do. It was literally, as a matter of fact, don't even read her, her journals. I want you to do, when you go home, go into Google and type in Planned Parenthood. Look at the map and look at all the communities that it's targeted. And I guarantee you the black and brown. So then why did you say you're against abortion because you believe in life and it's actually because you're against the fact that it targets black communities? I feel like that's two separate let me, arguments. Let me, let me help you out. Because Planned Parenthood, I'm against abortion in general. I'm against Planned Parenthood because they're the number one uh, organization that abort black babies. So that, that is two different arguments. Uh, I'm against Planned Parenthood and abortion. Have you ever thought that maybe they're not targeting black communities, but maybe no, that... because I read the documents. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I, I just, I've been fighting against Planned Parenthood ever since I got into politics, even when I was a Democrat. I'm fully aware of what they believe in, and what their facilities are. Um, and they've been targeting black lives for a long time, which is why our population is the way we want to do. Would you support Planned Um, you know what? I, I haven't even considered that. If it was just providing just women, women health, like, I had I, I have not considered it because they never said they would stop. I support other women facilities that um, provide mammograms and all 
that I, I support Single Women Foundation, Dak Prescott Single Mom Foundation, all that. So um, I support different organizations that actually provide women health outside of that. So I probably wouldn't support Planned Parenthood because there's really no need for me to because there's a private organization that I support already that provide the, the quality women's health. What about And there's also other private organizations that do the same thing. It doesn't have to be Planned Parenthood. I'm sorry, Planned Parenthood. Correct. They also do. And they also sign for a political party. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, just gonna, quick question. I don't think too long here. Do about a few of those. Um, are you for the separation of church and state in principle? So would you agree that same-sex couples should be given marriage licenses by the state? I don't think the government should be involved in marriage at all. So the benefits that you get as a married couple but from by the government, do you think those, sh those should not exist? I don't believe they should be involved at all. So they can do whatever the hell they want to do. Fair enough, that's a good answer. Thank you very much.
all of those things, and I'm doing a lot of outlines. Um, so what I'm saying is more of a comment versus a question, um, and something that I think you should consider when speaking to groups on college campuses where there are, like, like you said, multiple identities, right? And like how that might affect people. Because um, like you said, maybe like, I guess you want to say that liberals use emotions to come across and make moves and create movements and things like that, but also recognize, recognizing that those emotions matter. So I know that you said earlier, regarding abortion, that it is not about a woman's body, but it's about the child inside. But if you are pro-life, then please recognize that one, the baby wouldn't exist without that woman's body, and two, that that woman is alive too. And please consider th those things when you say statements about women in places where women are. Um, and I would just like you to be considerate of those things. But I appreciate you coming here and speaking. Thank you so much. Do you want to say anything? No, it wasn't saying it was a question. <laughs> Hi, so I was just, I just wanted to know your thoughts on affirmative action, especially in public institutions such as colleges, but they face admission on the same yeah, I don't agree with affirmative action. Like I, I kind of spoke on it earlier. I believe it had good intentions. Uh, I believe there was a period of time um, where we needed it. Um, but quite frankly, I don't need anybody to get into the school. Uh, and secondly, if the school doesn't want me, I pay way too much money to go to college. I don't want to give them my money. So that's my position. I believe it started off with good intentions, but just like the Harvard lawsuit that's going on right now, when you're discriminating against Asian students, um, that's wrong. You're, you're discriminating against another minority. And just because many of our Asian brothers and sisters have been successful in society doesn't mean that you have the right to discriminate against them. They, they, they want the American thing as well. Do you think it violates the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment? I do. Hi, first of all, I wanted to thank you for coming here. I think it, it takes a lot of courage to stand up and speak in this kind of environment. Oh, thank you. I, my question is on identity politics. I know there has been debate on the non left about whether it is fair to use identity politics because what I often observe when the left uses identity politics, they throw this web of standards or identity politics and then they trap someone in that identity politics mm -hmm. thing. But the thing that really bothers me is that they don't live up to their own standards they use to apply to others. And in this instance, would it actually be fair for a non-left, a libertarian or conservative person to use identity politics to, as a response, just to hold them accountable when using identity politics? Because there are people who say, don't use identity politics, it's only a left game, leftist game. But I think maybe there is a, a responsible way to use identity politics. I want your opinion on this. So I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. I'm not against people recognizing people's identity. I'm not against that. I think it's ignorant not to recognize people's identity. But when you judge people basic, solely based on their identity, that's where it becomes a problem. I think, look, identity can tell you a lot about people. But you, you also have to get to know the inside of the person as well. You know, and I think the left takes advantage of identity, um, but I also think sometimes conservatives ignore identity, and we just want to talk about facts and figures, um, and as a result of ignoring that, we don't win hearts and minds. Like, for example, uh, th there's this thing going on the right that really pisses me off, where we tell black people to get off the plantation, and it's like, and you think they're going to vote for you after you just told them to get off the plantation. That's a great outreach strategy. Um, and so there, there's all these things where don't, don't ignore, don't, don't be so anti-identity politics that you ignore who people are. And I think on the right, we should be more conscious of that. Um, just don't manipulate people's emotions through the identity like the left does. And I think that's a huge problem. Like I said, with most of the issues that we're facing today, they may have started with good intentions, whether it's identity, all that, be conscious of know people's identity. But when you start using it for your gain, just like capitalism, there's good capitalism and then there's crony capitalism. Um, and so I don't like to be on the extreme or be the or. Does that make sense? I think I understand. I think that's my opinion. Thank you. No problem. What's up, Hey, I was wondering if you, or what you thought might be like some of the reasons to 
like the decline of uh, like in wedlock marriages and like you know small business ownership and all sorts of you know other indicators of uh, like I guess sort of success, especially in the black community, like you know coming from the '60s and you know declining a lot. In that yeah, regard. It wasn't just the '60s. Even if you go back to like Black Wall Street. Uh, where some of the most prominent black businesses they had more people in the household and things uh, like that. I also think that there was a sense of, um, in our community, and I still think that it's there today, where they, where they depended on each other and not government themselves. I, I think there is a common misconception that I hear a lot of people on the right say, black people don't want to just be caught up in the Democratic Party. The conservative movement just had the created a place where they can call a home, right? If, if you just want to talk about economic issues and you want to ignore history, if you want to uh, ignore justice issues, you've got a lot of black people who have never given us a chance in debt. Um, I, I, I just think that they want you to listen to them. Part of the reason why Donald Trump was successful with Kanye is because he showed up and listened. I can't tell you the amount of times where I go to conservative conferences and they ask me how to get more black people to support them. And then they tell me why all of what I said was wrong. And I'm like, I thought you invited me to tell you about my community. And you're now telling me what you're comfortable with. Um, and I also think there is this rise of, um, you know, I see this in media. Um, I can be an odd one at times because I'm not your typical black conservative who's just going to pander to the right. I'm going to speak my mind. And I actually live in my community. Um, and so, um, I have, I still go to the same barbershop that I've been at since the second grade. Even I moved to D.C., like, I, I've tried to make it back home. And I've used it as a place of my compass to know what my community um, wants, what they need. It's like the center of politics. And I make sure that I'm invested in black businesses. Um, and, and so I think that community that was in the old days was, is still there. Um, I just think that the right is doing a bad job in inviting them. I think we have only time for two more questions. Thank you. Uh, so as a uh, white, straight, Republican male uh, on a college campus, I'm often told my opinion doesn't matter or that I can't speak about certain issues such as abortion. Um, and no matter how hard I try to meet people in the middle, they often aren't willing to meet me there. So what is your advice for someone such as myself and so many of us so we can come out, we can wear our Make Mary Great Again hats and not get practically stoned to death? That's a good question. Um, look, there are people that are looking for dialogue. Um, those are the people that you want to win over. Like, I appreciate, there are some people in here that have different points of view. I appreciate them coming here today because there's other people that share their view viewpoint that we, where they're sitting in their echo chamber and not have those types of conversations. So even though it's a, you know, viewpoints obviously that I disagree with, you took the first step in saying, you know what? I don't know what he believes. I think I may know what he believes. Let's have some conversation about it. That doesn't mean that I'm going to change my point of view. That doesn't mean that you're going to change your point of view. But it does believe. It does mean that we can coexist as Americans and not just say that person is a hateful person just because they have a different point of view as me. The majority of my friends are liberals because I like them. <laughs> like politics is not all that defines people. I hate going over to the right because they listen to music that I don't like, they have food that I don't like. I just share a political <coughs> point of view with them, and I accept them for who they are. But after I get out of my political circles, I go back home where I can get some good seasoned food, and <laughs> I, can, I can get some hip hop instead of country, and I have a good time. And so, um, look, the, if we, we have diverse communities. Uh, I'm not going to pretend and lie to you and say it's going to be easy for you as a conservative on a college campus, but I will say be bold. There's no, there's no time to go in, in your dorm and not be who you are. Um, where you're at. Um, all I would ask, though, is that be comfortable. Don't get offended with having a conversation. No. Be bold in who you are, but know what you believe. So when you do face students like this that may have a point of view, that you're able to defend your point of view and also hear them out. Don't just know your point of view, know their point of view as well. That way you're able to have that dialogue with them. Because, if, for example, um, we just had a Planned Parenthood conversation. 
I couldn't have had that conversation if I hadn't already did my research on Planned Parenthood, if I didn't know the history behind the organization. Don't just know your point of view, know the opposing view as well. Uh, last question over here. Have you met Ben Shapiro? I have. How is he, what is he like? Um, ben is Ben. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I, I'll say this, me and Ben don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. Our politics may be aligned, but our strategies is totally different. Again, he says facts don't care about your feelings. I agree to a certain extent, but votes do care about your feelings. So if your politics cannot line up with feelings and connection to people's emotions, you may be great as a pundit and a commentator, but when it comes to winning hearts and minds, it's not going to work for you in the next election. So that's my <laughs> Okay, thank you guys so much for coming and I want to thank Dave from the staff over here. He helped us out with that. Uh, and also uh, Owen and Aiden who are supporting me a lot of this. Uh, th thanks a lot for Lawrence. He flew all the way from <laughs>